be acceptable to you, O Lord, strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So before we get to this good news reading for the night, there's a little few things I want to talk about for about Ash Wednesday. How many of you actually know why you're sitting here now with this black ash thing on your forehead? Why do we do this? To be a witness. To be a witness, but you're going to go home right after this and wash it off. Oh, you're going to go to the bar. <laughs> you are. But how many of you are going to go home right after this and wash this off? So the reason that you do right, exactly, I am. Right? The reason we do this is quite right. Part of it is because it's a witness. It shows people that you have this mark of the cross on your forehead. But why else do we do it? What's the point of this? What's the point of me taking these ashes, getting my fingers all black, and, and putting them on your forehead? What's the point of all that? There's something to it. There is. What is it? Exactly. That's part of it. Yes. To remind us where we came from and where we're going to end up. Because God created Adam out of the dust. And the thing that I said to you up here was, remember you are dust. And to dust you shall return. There's no getting out of this world alive. It's just not going to happen. Every last one of us is going to die. Unless Jesus comes back before that happens, every last one of us is going to die. There's no way around it. It's going to happen. The thing that we have to remember, though, is death is not the end. Death is a step in the process. Death is a doorway that we walk through. Right? Ash Wednesday was created, and I'm, I'm using some notes here from a wonderful colleague of mine in Texas who's probably preaching just about right now, too. They started their um, Ash Wednesday service at 6.30, so they're probably about to this point. He's probably preaching right now. He wrote a blog for his congregation of about a month ago, that talks about the history and the biblical understanding of where the ashes come from. Ashes in the Bible come from Genesis chapter 18. Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. That's Abraham speaking to God. Ashes are a sign of grief in the Bible. Right? Esther, when Mordecai found out all that had happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and went through the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. On being made aware of sin and grief and sadness, we sometimes call this a repentance, a desire to change one's life. When Jonah found out about the king of Nineveh, when the news reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne, he removed his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. These ashes are often tied to the dust of creation, a reminder of where we came from. Right? Genesis chapter 2, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Job said, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you, and therefore I despise myself and repent in dust, dust and ashes. And ashes are often connected with prayer and action. And Daniel says, then I turned to the Lord God to seek an answer by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And Jesus himself talked to the, to the people that followed him, and they were familiar with the connection of sackcloth and ashes. In Luke chapter 10, he said, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. But for the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. It reminds us of our need for repentance. That long spill about everything that we've done wrong when we confessed our sins just a little bit ago. Everything that we've done, everything that we haven't done, the times that we've messed up, the times that we haven't gone far enough in helping people. It's about our repentance. It's about humility. It's about grief. It's a reminder of where we're going and whose we are. Right? There was one monk, I'm not going to try to say his name. If you want to know it, you can come and read it. But by the year 100, by the year 1000, the season of Lent was becoming a time when all Christians would prepare themselves for Easter. And at this point, on the first, as the first day, Ash Wednesday sets the tone for the whole season, one monk suggested that people should not just have ash crosses put on their foreheads, but should have ashes poured over their whole bodies. To remind us where we came from. And you think I've got this nasty, dirty cross on my forehead, right? It's, it's made out of what? 
Where did I get it? I had a fire last night. I just scooped some stuff out of... It's from the palms. If you don't know that either, that's a good thing to know. It's from the palms that we keep. I have boxes of old palms that I keep after Palm Sunday. And we burn them the next year to create these ashes. So they're the most non-allergic... I don't know the right words for that. But hypoallergenic thing to use for this. They're mixed with a little bit of um, oil... You might notice a, a slight scent to them. But what else did we use ashes for? Long, long ago. Did anybody remember this? Did anybody actually do this? Who said that? Soap. It's a cleanser. Ash is a clean, cleaning unit. It's, a, it's a, something that you can use to clean with. And you think it's dirty. But it's not. It reminds us that God cleans us. God takes us from the dust and makes us to be beautiful creatures. And then we're going to return to the dust and he's going to bring us home. So we get this lesson tonight from Matthew chapter 18, which isn't the normal Ash Wednesday night text. But we get this text where the disciples come to Jesus and say, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I would have expected Jesus would have said, not any of you. Just don't get it. Bless you. But Jesus took a child and said, unless you're like this child, whoever wants to be great in the kingdom of heaven, truly I tell you, unless you became change and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And our version then goes on in verse 4, whoever becomes humble like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble... How does one become humble? Hmm? Yes. You say it louder so they can hear you in the back. There's a character in Uriah Heath and David Copperfield. Says all the time, I'm so humble. I'm so humble. Uriah Heath, yes. How do you become humble? And that's actually a bad translation. And that, that, that's what makes me ask you, how do you become humble? Because it says, whoever becomes humble, like this child. Actually, the way the word is there in the Greek and the way that the tenses are done, it's more like whoever makes themselves to be humble. You have to make yourself humble. Right? One of the things that the ashes remind us of in, the, in a Jewish understanding is, is our humility. How it's not about us. It's about God. It's about what God does through all of this. And that's what Lent is about. It's 46 days from today until Easter Sunday when Jesus rises from the dead. And during this 40 days, right? You notice I just said two different things. I said 46 days. Because it is actually 46 days from now till Easter Sunday. But there's only 40 days in Lent because we don't really include the Sundays. They just kind of happen during Lent. They don't really count during Lent. So these 40 days remind us of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness when he prepared himself to go to do what he was going to do. And during these 40 days we prepare ourselves and we get ready to do what we're going to have to do. To live our lives as God children. To understand that unless we make ourselves like a little child... And have childlike faith in God and understand that everything that he does is for us. And humble ourselves to the way that we follow after where he's leading us. We're not going to make it in. And during these 40 days you need to draw closer to him. And you can do that in any number of ways. You can give something up. I told Clyde earlier today I'm giving up oysters for Lent. I don't like oysters so it's not really going to hurt me that much. I saw something just a little bit ago that said that, I'm, that somebody's going to give up winter for Lent. And I think that's a great idea. So I'm all on board for that. Right? You can give something up. You can give up chocolate. You can give up... One year I gave up coffee. I actually did give up coffee. One year. It actually wasn't too bad. I drank Mountain Dew. So... <laughs> so. You give something up though then. What, why do you give something up? You give something up because that helps you... Understand what Jesus did for you. Or maybe you take something on. Maybe you do something new. 
Um, if you don't read the Bible, say you're going to read the Bible every morning when you drink your coffee or your tea or water or milk or whatever you drink in the morning. Or maybe you could do a devotional, like our devotional we have back there on the table. Or you could do the devotional, there's several of them out there where you take a picture a day, there's a word and you associate that word and you take a picture and you post that on the internet. You post it on Instagram or on Facebook or on wherever you want to post it. Or you, maybe you do something else, maybe you give an item away. My wife has been big on making each one of our children give something away each day during Lent. Give something away that somebody else could use that you don't use anymore. Do something that helps you understand what Jesus did for you so that you can draw closer to Him. Because it's like making ourselves like little children who have to do what? Rely on someone else for everything that they get. Right? The little child is not just simply because they're cute and they're innocent. Because in Jesus' day, children weren't cute and innocent. Right? They were things that we didn't want in the public eye. They were the marginalized. They were the people that nobody else looked like. And Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be what society doesn't want to associate with. That's what Jesus is calling us to. To give up ourselves. To pick up our cross. To remember whose we are and where we're going. And that while we're here, we have something to do. So remember that. And wear your cross to the bar. And let them see it. And let them know that God loves you. And that God also loves them. And don't just wear it tonight. But wear it forever. Because that's where God put it. When he named you at the font. And each Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, when we come together to remember where we're going. So give your life over to him. And draw closer to him and deepen your faith over these next 40 days. And let us all see where God is calling us. And how he's leading us to share his love.